impressive introduction, thank you. There'll be a bit more nepotism in the slides, you'll note if you're paying attention. Um, as Matthew, uh, thank you very much for asking me to come and talk. Um, I'm on an entirely different subject to the two very impressive presentations we've had today. What I'm talking about is the kind of the economy. The story could relate to any number of, of cities or towns in the UK. I work in Sunderland, so I'm relating it to Sunderland. Um, but as I say, it's, it's quite a common story these days. So are we working? Yes, we are. Um, it's kind of, it deals with legacy in two different ways. I'm going to start talking about a kind of negative legacy that um, we've got in Sunderland, we're still struggling with in Sunderland and is based on something that happened historically. But how, within the creative sector, um, I've stolen a legacy from somewhere else, a legacy idea from somewhere else, and trying to apply it in Sunderland and trying to create a new way of working in the creative sector that isn't reliant on public sector funding. Big challenge. Okay. So I, I can see that most of you were only just being born when all this started. And some of you might groan. But it does go back to the years of the lady called Margaret Thatcher. Um, and many, many people and many, many people's parents in this room will have been affected by the, the pan-European um, cuts in and cuts and um, it's a sort of reconfiguration of major industries across Europe that occurred in that time. And it was something that was initiated in what we then called the common market. It's the European Union now. How it affected the North was in the loss of a lot of our key manufacturing, massive employing organisations like the coal mines, the shipbuilding and the steelworks. And that's a common story. It affected, like other places like concert, lots of... Uh, towns and cities in North Yorkshire, it affected Sunderland quite badly and gave us massive unemployment. All of those core industries had supply chains and allied industries alongside them. So it wasn't just the people in those industries that lost their jobs. And so the fallout of that was immense. Different cities and towns dealt with it in different ways. Some people found that their working population was actually quite responsive to the idea of self-employment. They wanted to invest their redundancy monies and all of this and set up small businesses. Sunderland just didn't. In Sunderland, everybody wants to be employed. That's it, everybody. The vast majority. People want to be employed. They want large employers. They want security going forward. What on earth were we going to do here? How were we going to resolve that? So what we did, um, we've got a beautiful photo of a beautiful piece of glass there. We, we looked at what we had, and one of the things that had survived everything was our oldest uh, industry, glassmaking, which goes back to, should know this number, uh, six, uh, thank you, thank you, husband. <laughs> <laughs> husband glassmaker, 674. Um, so massive, massive heritage in glassmaking. Um, and that has still survived because as a city we've learned to roll with the changes and turn it into what is now um, a centre of excellence for contemporary craftsmanship in glass. And that's partly through the National Glass Centre, partly through the university, partly through local businesses. But this sector isn't going to employ very many people. So we went on an international mission to see what we could do. And through that, we attracted Nissan. Big success story of, of the century almost, for two centuries now, for Sunderland. Along with Nissan came their supply chain. And in that supply chain came lots of, of international companies from all over the world. And we, we increased the employment opportunities again. The downside of that decision was that Nissan are very famous for running what they call a just-in-time system. And that means you need your supply chain very close to the core manufacturing base. 
That manufacturing base has to have strong logistics to get to the port, to get down to London on the trailers, uh, the carriers. And so all of that new employment was, was driven in the outskirts of the city, close to the A19 corridor, the A1 corridor, and so on and so forth. What that had the effect of doing was completely depleting the city centre. All of our industries have moved outside because that pattern has followed on over the last 30 years. So we've now got a very depleted retail sector. And what was left in the city centre, coincidentally, was a whole bundle of small creative businesses that were kind of quite stalwart and digging in, but they weren't really prospering. And that kind of has gone on for, the, for, for about 30 years. Got more glass. No, there you go. Husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> by Roger Ty. Um, what, we, what we did was we looked at those investors and thought, how are we going to be able to use what they're bringing in a, 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 bit, a, bit, more, a, a bit more to our advantage? Um, and we found we were getting fantastic responses and a fantastic relationship building with the American companies in that supply chain. Now, this is a slight aside, but I need to explain this at this point. What we did out of that American relationship, we thought, well, how can we strengthen this? Is anybody here from Sunderland at all, at all? Yay! One, two! <laughs> In Sunderland, there um, is uh, Washington, Washington, Tyne and Weir. Within Washington, Tyne and Weir is Washington Old Hall. Way, way back in the 1300s, Washington Old Hall became the ancestral home of the family that eventually became George Washington, first president of the United States. We went along to Washington, D.C. with that story and said, you're first president. We have your ancestral home. And they just loved it. And we are... <laughs> You can imagine, can't you? Um, we have even stood in the gardens of said ancestral home, and a whole bunch of Mackhams have stood in that garden, hand on heart, singing the Stars and Stripes, or whatever, Star Spangled Banner, that's what it's called. It's just, you've done well not to stand next to me trying to sing that, I tell you. But um, they loved it. They lapped it up, and... Um, we are the only non-capital city to have a formal friendship agreement with what is arguably the most powerful city in the world. The most successful relationship out of that friendship agreement, we run backwards and forwards every year we try to, possibly every other year, depending on budgets. Um, we've made some fantastically strong relationships, and the best relationships, ironically, are in our weakest sector, what has been our weakest sector until of late, which is the creative sector. So we've, we've been talking with glassmakers and artists and ceramicists, and we've been learning about how they work. Now in Washington, in America, across the piece, there is absolutely no public funding for the arts. Very, very difficult to get hold of. Here, historically, we've been very reliant on public sector funding. You know, every time anything comes up, is there, is there funding in it? Where can I get the funding from? People are always writing funding bids to Arts Council, Crafts Council, wherever. Our creative sector does seem to be overly reliant on public sector funding. And now we're in an age of austerity. There is, there's very little funding to be had. You have to work very hard for it. And some of us in Sunderland, we've made different decisions about where we want our funding to go. And it's not into creativity. But ironically, we now want to develop a stronger creative economy. What are we going to do? How are we going to do that? So from the Americans, we learned about a thing called the Artist's Covenant. And how they deal with it in, in America is they make pacts with each other. Artists and creatives make a pact under this thing they call the Artist's Covenant. And how it kind of works is that if you are offered an opportunity you actively open up that opportunity for a fellow artist. It doesn't have to succeed. They may not get a place in the same exhibition. 
they, you know, they may not get a part of, of the commission process. But it's an opportunity. And so by that, it becomes a virtuous circle. You keep going, you keep opening doors for your fellow creatives, and you drive a lot more movement. So that's the basis on which we're trying to move forward. And that is what I hope is the legacy that I'm going to leave. So how have we been doing it in Sunderland? Well, as I say, we've got no money. So it's at this point that I kind of was really interested in Nick's talk, because I, I do find I'm a bit of a pig. Um, I, do, I do seem to be doing um, a lot of motivating, a lot of coaching, a lot of getting stuck in, and a lot of bribery, frankly. <laughs> I haven't got a lot of money, so what I do is encourage people to come to me with ideas. This guy wanted to run a, um, a street art festival. I, c I couldn't fund it for him, but I said to him, I tell you what, we'll give you a commission to paint. That's a massive building. You can't really tell to do some street art in a scruffy part of town and I will help you run a street art festival which he did with a hundred international uh, spray paint artists um, which was a risk in Sunderland because we're not necessarily not well known for our reception of these things are we at the back um, <laughs> but it went down an absolute storm it went down a storm and nobody was more surprised than me Creative Cohesion is um, another project. Um, we, a, a, a bit of remodelling of, of a couple of, of empty buildings now, um, courtesy of the council's building and maintenance team, quite a lot of facilitation by me, and a little bit of money. They now house, have spaces for 23 creative businesses. They've got a gallery, they've got a working hot shop, they run, um, workshops, um, they run the Maker's Markets, they do all kinds of things. And they're now running what was deemed last year to be the best successful family arts festival, uh, the most successful family arts uh, festival. Um, and last, last example of nepotism, um, coordinated by my daughter, Kat. Um, so that, 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 that's the family. Okay, that's us all accounted for. Um, so that's great. Um, and then we led to a project that's taken, taken me about nine months now. Frankie and the Heartstrings came along to me and said, Oh, Anne, can you find me a building? Want to do, we want to do a record store. So we put them in the old tourist information office. Um, again, I brought our building maintenance team in to do all the uh, repairs and everything and tidy up. Built them some record holders there and just, just set them away. So they held their own gigs. We've had, got free gigs in, for, from local bands. Um, they use it as a space for gigs, music workshops, art exhibitions. They've created a really vibrant hub and inspired other projects. So we've got another great coffee shop now called Homeside Coffee, set up by the Lilliput Band. They're running film shows, uh, film clubs, book clubs, writing clubs, that's going to store. So with their music connections, they've brought bigger names, also people like Badly Drawn Boy, uh, to come down to Pop Prex. And that is sparking an audience engagement. So we're starting, we're doing the things, but now we're starting to get the engagement. And there's the audience <laughs> engagement. <laughs> You didn't get cues in Sunderland, unless it's for a pasty. Um, that is not for Greg's, but it was actually for a free gig by Maximo Park. But then, closely followed by Franz Ferdinand two weeks ago, which was an absolute storm. And so that's got us TV coverage, international coverage, um, all manner of interest now in, oh wow, suddenly stuff's happening in Sunderland. That's just another image of, of uh, Franz. Um, it's just another thing that's happening in Sunderland. It's all over Facebook, um, getting onto Twitter, running websites, and are we there? We've started. The question is, Without any funding, 
and we're still fighting because it's going to be a couple of years before I, I identify any funding, we're starting to get to the legacy of the artist's covenant that I would like to leave behind. We're starting to inspire people to engage, we're, we're getting people interested, and most importantly, this is not driven by me with a master plan, this is driven by the sector being facilitated. So if we can keep that going, that's what I hope is the legacy that I leave in Sunderland before I retire. I've got a way to go, but it's on the horizon. Um, and I'm going to leave it there, because that's a positive way to end, in a frenzy. Thank you.